folks, Joseph A. Savara here, and as we continue with the Hannibal Lecter series, I'm going to review the third installment, which is technically the first sequel to the Academy Award winning film, The Science of the Lambs, which is based on a Thomas Harris novel called Hannibal. The 2001 crime psychological thriller with Anthony Hopkins reprising his role as the cannibalistic serial killer and former psychiatrist, Dr. Hannibal Lecter. But this is, of course, the new chapter in the series that winds up becoming as gory and grotesque than ever before. And it actually brings it into a whole new direction and a big controversy behind this because uh, this time around they get director Ridley Scott to join in and who just came fresh from his uh, his Oscar winning film Gladiator which came out in 2000 you know, he's been best known for directing films such as Alien and Blade Runner and many others that follow and also he brought in screenwriters uh, David Mammoth, you know, who's been best known for his uh, playwright, including Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and Schindler's List writer Steve Zalin. But it's a very different turn. Um, this time it has Julianne Moore replacing Jodie Foster as FBI agent Carice Starling. It once again, you know, goes on an investigation by catching. Um, the serial killer, um, or even helping them, um, Dr. Hannibal Lecter, and the fact that they're trying to find out all the clues and everything that's going on, while you know being uh, under suspension and punishment during the shootout that's at the beginning of the movie that we're going to get to later. Yeah, it's it's very dark as it turns out, but I think that's what they were going for, for that level of violence and all of that. And this is, of course, the special edition DVD that I just bought recently at 7-Eleven for only $4.99, so that was a good deal. And apparently this is the only edition that they ever got released. I mean, I know outside of the U.S. they did release it on Blu-ray by Universal, because Universal did co-produce this film with MGM aside. On the Ryan Pictures for releasing The Signs of the Lambs back in 1991. Yeah, because... MGM didn't purchase Orion Pictures until 1997, you know, due to their bankruptcy problems and the fact that they're trying to resolve the company back to its place, but until they sort of shut it down after that. But now Orion is finally back after all these years, so now we get to have that. And also the fact that he brought back um, Italian film producer Dino De Laurentiis. To, to finally produce this movie, so it's really cool. You know, since, you know, he didn't do um, Signs of the Lambs that he was going to, but, you know, since uh, Manhunter was already a failure at the box office. I also heard some uh, reports on this that that Daniel De Laurentiis didn't really like Manhunter because he thought that he didn't feel like that it wasn't sort of in the spirit of Thomas Harris' novel, you know, Red Dragon. So he thought that Manhunter was just a whole different story. Yeah, but you know, I, I had to disagree with him on that level. Although, I can see why he was going for that. Because I, I do love Manhunter. I think Manhunter suits its purpose for what it is. And I, I love how they, they capture that spirit. But, well, that's how he had to deal with, you know. But this time he works with his wife uh, Marfa, yeah, and just to produce this movie. And not only did he did this, but he also went on to produce the prequel Red Dragon, yeah, which is in 2002. And I'm going to get to that later. But this is, of course, the edition that I got. And sad to say, um, the the Blu-ray that just got released in the U.S. is bare bones. There's no extras whatsoever that's right at the back, as you can see. Yeah, right there. Yeah, it's just, just a shame, because it, it really is a cool edition that they have. It's a two-disc special edition. Um, but the Blu-ray that I found was a 25th gigabytes, and it's just the movie itself. Yeah, the transfer isn't nearly as good, 
Though at least it's better than the DVD suggestedly, but still not as good because I think it was sort of, you know, filtered a little bit here and there, but I think it still matches up a bit. And I know that outside of the U.S., um, they did have the movie with extras that's from the DVD, but there are a few things that are missing, so I say this is the only way to get this movie. <laughs> But if you want to get the Blu-ray and keep that along with this, then I think this would be a perfect combo pack. So, in fact, it would have been nice to make it as it is for a free disc set. So, yeah, maybe someday I'll take my chances. But I'm cool with this, and I'm just glad I have this in my collection. So now I have four movies so far. I don't Like I said, I don't have the fifth movie, which is Hannibal Rising. But I do agree it's one of the worst prequels that I've ever saw. And I agree, I didn't like that one that much. I wish they did a whole lot better than what they assume with. So, what can you do? The movie stars Anthony Hopkins with Julianne Moore, Ray Liotta, of course, just playing a, a basically playing a jerk role or some strange role as, as you can assume because he does always play that. Gary Oldman, uh, Frankie Frazon, you know, who was in the first two Hannibal Lecter films, Manhunter and The Signs of the Lambs. This time he's reprising his role once again as Barney, since he did play Lieutenant Fisk in Manhunter. Gina Carlo Giannini, yeah, and this is interesting that this time he gets to play the Expector like he once did play it in, in the comedy called Once Upon a Crime. Yeah, also from MGM and produced by Daniel De Laurentiis. I guess he wanted to bring uh, Giancarlo Giannini to join in. Yeah, he was also in the movie uh, Mimic as well. Um, Hazel Goodman, Robert Verti, Arinko Loperoso, um, Francis Gummin, and, and David Andrews. Yeah, once again, it's written by. David Mammoth and Steven Zellin and it's directed by Ridley Scott. The movie begins set 10 years later after the capture of serial killer Buffalo Bill whose name is simply James Gum. FBI Special Agent Clarice Starling wants up getting involved in a bungling drug raid in, inside a fish market where she meets her friend already going undercover as an FBI agent trying to save her from all the the drug lords out there and when all of a sudden the FBI uh, cops wants up you know you know backing down or backing up or whatever and it ends up in a in a violent shootout leads to the point where where that lady wants up since she's also a mother so carrying her baby along with it and she also pulls out a Mac 10 machine gun wants up shooting uh, Clarice in the stomach while wearing her vest you know she tries to tell her not to pull it out but then she wants up shooting her anyway so she got killed she wants up saving her baby you know wash out all the blood that's coming right out so yeah you know, she felt really bad about what happened mostly because it was a sort of a dick move from all the FBI agents and it causes her to to get in trouble yeah, it almost leads to, to the blame and, and the suspension that this was going to happen. But getting involved in a connection to uh, the cannibalistic serial killer and former psychiatrist, Dr. Hannibal Lecter, who's once again played by Anthony Hopkins, you know, reprising his role. And the fact that it goes to the attention of the only surviving victim, who happens to be a wealthy child molester named Mason Berger and he's played by Gary Oldman already having his face being horrifically disfigured all the way around with all these scars in which he actually tells a story that he was invited inside uh, his friend Mercer's uh, house you know just for drink and what he does was that he was you know he was just playing around you know while being drunk with Hannibal Lecter just doing 
all these uh, crazy things. You know, try to you know try out the mask and everything, and then he wants up uh, being on top, you know, handcuffed and tied up, and then suddenly he, you know, he decided that um, the Hannibal Lecter had to take a shard of glass and gave it to him, and actually cut off his, you know, try to cut off half of his face here and there with all these scars, yeah, and trying to feed it to the dogs after that. Yeah, parts of the skin coming right off. Yeah, I mean, he, he thought it was a good idea at the time, but then, yeah, he knew he was, he knew this whole thing was, was what caused his face to get all messed up. Yeah, he almost looks like an old man right there just by looking underneath it, but with that mask alone, it is indeed, you know, Gary Oldman under there. So anyway, um, his uh, choice was to uh, offer Starling to actually use his immense wealth and, and political influence to resign um, Lecter's case by meeting with her in his mansion and actually try to find an exaggerated scheme just to capture, torture, and kill Lecter completely. So this is sort of a, um, a sweet revenge against him. So at this rate, you know, Starling wants up getting all the clues and, and involving the audio tapes and all this other stuff, you know, involving the conversation that she had with Lecter, um, like around 10 years ago, and all of this, and trying to figure out all the, the investigation involving this, you know, including the fact that she detects uh, a strange fragrance and perfume that's that was later identified by what seems to be the ingredients that's only available in, in a few shops. It turns out that um, she was tracking down by checking all the surveillance cameras um, from all the stores everywhere, including uh, the one that's located in Italy, yeah, in Florence, Italy, where we've, we've now finally suspected that Hannibal Lecter was actually there at the time. And, and she figured, you know, he actually bought all this stuff, maybe just to please uh, Clarice. And that's sort of, yeah, just mailing it to her. Because, you know, I think, you know, at this sort of way, you know, Lecter was having sort of a, a romantic relationship with her in, in a nicely manner. Well, but as a result of that, um, Starling decided to hire a, uh, a chief inspector named... Ronaldo Pazzi, who's played by Giancarlo Giannini. So just to go uh, investigate the disappearance of a library courier. And suddenly, um, Hannibal wants up uh, disguising himself as, as the assistant by the name of Dr. Fell. So he offers now to become the caretaker of the library. So, yeah, and in fact, because now we discover what was happening. Because... Lecter did kill 14 people while the attack. So, recognizing this surveillance tape, Pazzi decided to access the backhand database of rotten fugitives on the internet. Yeah, and this is one of those uh, moments where he actually spotted a website where they have a lot of top 10 fugitives that's already been pictured around. And get this for size, because Underneath it, where you see Hannibal Lecter on the bottom, on top of it, you wouldn't believe this, but they actually put in the terrorist by the name of Osama Bin Laden. Yes, that's right. And this movie came out uh, a couple months before the 9-11 event had happened. And, of course, they suspected it's this guy. I, I find it hard to believe that they actually uh, they put his face in on the website in, in this movie. Now, his name was actually credited as Osama with a U instead of an O. Yeah, just so you know. But well, anyway, um, so it leads to the suspicion that Pazis decided to hire a pickpocker who wants up uh, trying to find out about uh, about Hannibal Lecter to see if, if he can get the fingerprints. So all of a sudden you know, by while well, the pickpocket decided to chase him around just to see how this is going to happen, you know, Hannibal Lecter winds up stabbing the pickpocket with a knife, and he finally got the fingerprints as uh, Pussy has suggested it. 
So suddenly, you know, he gave him that, the fingerprints, and then suddenly all that blood started to squirt out uh, out of his stomach. Yeah, in that in a very gory way. Yeah, this was where they had the the violence level right there. But that also leads to other things that were going around. So meanwhile, a Virgil wants up uh, bribing Justice Department official named Paul Crendo, who's played by Ray Liotta, by accusing Starling about, about the involvement of of a note that that was sent by Hannibal Lecter, and actually leads to a suspension. Yeah, I mean, he, I know. I mean, he was a complete asshole in this movie, and this is basically what he gets at the end, which we're going to lead to that later on. So, Lecter wants of luring Starling to Union Station, but suddenly uh, Burgeon's uh, guards wants of following Starling by capturing him and, and transport him to Virgil. So, so I figured, yeah, they... They knew this was going to be a setup after that, because you know he was about to to use her trying to you know save him or so. When the superiors refused to act towards this, um, Starling on his own enabled his infuriated Berger's estate, which is actually in a room that's filled with uh, wild hogs. Yeah, those pigs, which they basically go around eating their victims. Yeah, and they're very you know. You know, oh, they're very, you know, aggressive in that sort of way. Which, of course, it was called uh, wild boars, as that's what they were referred to. So Starling wants of interviewing to free Lecter from being attacked by those wild boars. But she wants of being ruined after a shootout, you know, between uh, Virgil's men. You know, which, of course, she wants of shooting them. So she, he wants of uh, taking uh, Starling out of that house and... Well, Virgil, of course, uh, wants of falling inside the pit where the boars are, and and actually wants of biting his face, you know, along with them. So, so then they escape, you know. And this is what leads to one of the final moments in the movie was that shows that infamous scene. But when Hannibal Lecter wants of taking Starling inside the house, you know, she just um, gave her a shot of morphine that he injected her into and try to fix the scar that she had on her shoulder she wants up um, in bed you know while uh, while he actually uh, wants up um, taking the uh, Paul Krenler by drugging him and actually alert to him to to the house and then suddenly uh, starting once up awakening already being absorbed by the morphine she wants up wearing a uh, a black velvet uh, evening dress, already being shocked about what's going on underneath the kitchen, or or at this rate the dining room is when he spotted uh, Hannibal Lecter just cooking some food with um, yeah cooking a a Fourth of July dinner at this if you think about it with Paul Kringer already have his skull being um, cut off like that. Pretty Starling wants up sitting on the table, you know, trying to get ready for it because you know she was hungry. Yeah, you know, with uh, Kringer aside, and <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Lecter wants up ripping the the head of of his skull, which re reveals his brain, his actual brain that, and he actually cuts off parts of it, which is called the, the prefrontal cortex that he and he actually uh, takes part of that out and and wants up cooking it and then feeds it to uh, Kringle so yeah it's like <laughs> he's eating parts of his brain yeah it, it's a really really strange and disturbing scene that you ever thought you would see on on screen yeah, I mean it was a very messed up one plus the blood was coming off from his head too as you could tell. So then, uh, yeah, cause being shock and horror, Starling decided to actually handcuff him to his hand by, you know, just so he could take him in. But suddenly, Lecter wants up having her caught in, in the refrigerator by putting her hair and closing it and actually taking off the handle off just to lock it together so she could be caught. 
and suddenly he wants to take in a meat cleaver and actually tries to either cut off her hand or in some cases it cuts off his hand because that's when he says this is gonna hurt and then and then you see her actually screaming and but then by the end you'll know that um, she finally escaped without having her hand being chopped up and then suddenly you know all the cops finally found her you know trying to reveal who she is and while you know fireworks started going up and then then the next shot was when Hannibal Lecter was finally on the plane you know just you know just leaving and already you know cast off already you know he bought his lunch that he was about to eat and then suddenly a little boy that's sitting right next to him just wanted to try out a few things because there wasn't any good airport food so so at this rate Lecter decided to have the little boy try out uh, Kranger's plane <laughs> yeah it, it's really messed up at the end so it's not nearly as good as uh, the signs of the lambs and definitely not as good as man under eater when it comes to this but I'll, I think it's worth watching. You know, I I gave it a look for it. It's I I would say it was sort of in in a different way that the movie was going for. But you know, because they're trying to focus on the novel, because it, it's very dark and very creepy and very uh, you know, yes, <laughs> grotesque and gory. But I got to say this: it was really cool that. I got to see Anthony Hopkins reprising this role again, but this time we get to see more of him than just less of him here and there. But but he, he did have tons of good scenes in, in the Signs of the Lambs, and yeah, and, and we got to see more of him at this point, but this time we basically see a whole lot of him. I mean, this is definitely, you know, a Hannibal Lecter movie where, where it just focused more on him and and less on all the characters. And Clary Starling, you know, gets, you know, more than what she had to take. And I feel sorry for her too because, you know, she had to be treated like shit during the shootout and all this other crap, you know, and the investigation that leads to all, all the suspension that she was getting for. I, I agree. Because they, they had a lot of asshole cops, you know, dealing with all this garbage. Yeah, because it's one of those cliches. You know, they always have to have an asshole cop in every single movie like this always having the female lead or anybody else getting all the all the trouble and all the blame that that they caused which they didn't deserve it I mean because you know Julianne Moore did a great job you know portraying the role that Jodie Foster had played in Signs of the Lambs and and this was a very strong role for her because I knew she can actually take it she is a very fine actress, also very beautiful too, and hot. Yeah, I admit that too. And I think it worked. And it didn't matter to me, even if, uh, if Foster couldn't play it. Because I know Foster at the time was just doing a movie. Yeah, you know, she was directing a film that's going to star uh, Claire Danes in it. So, yeah. Because I figured she was busy. And you know, they weren't going to get Jonathan Demme to direct. And neither was uh, the screenwriter... Ted Talley, yeah, which then later he went on to write the screenplay for Red Dragon that follows after this. But I think it's interesting that they were going to go for new things. So they wanted to make it into a different approach. But there were several good scenes here and there, and, and I, I did enjoy what they were going for, you know, for that level. Um, I like some of the good scenes that they had for, um, for Clary Starling, especially when, you know, Hannibal Lecter is basically just helping her out, you know, getting, you know, getting absolved all over this, this situation. You know, try to help her get, go catch, uh, you know, killers are being involved, and of course, you know, she wants up helping him too, because you know they knew Mason was just part of the, the act. Yeah, since this is part of his revenge, and the fact that you know. Cricker actually bribed him into this. But on the other hand, though, Anthony Hopkins, once again, playing the role in an evil, creepy, and, and very chilling manner, because you got to see more of him doing all these crazy stuff by by actually watching 
some clips of him actually attacking one of the victims. He has to kill 14 people, so that's basically what they were going for. And yeah, it has all these lines, including, uh, is this Clarice? Yes. Why, hello, Clarice. Did you get my letter? Yeah, in that sort of way. Yeah, once he was killing the, the inspector, Pazzi was, you know, we just tied him up and already about to hang him out in front of the entire crowd while the two guys wound up chasing him around. And, you know, one of them got sliced with, uh, with his knife in the neck and blood started to shoot up. Yeah, in fact, it was starting to shoot up right from the back. Yeah, it's really <laughs> a very violent movie. It was great to see Frankie Frazon in the movie again, you know, just playing the role that he once played in as Barney. You know, I, I like the scene. He has to grab a pigeon that wasn't moving at all. You know, he was he was actually sick or or possibly died or so. Well, I don't know. And I like some of the shots that um, that Scott was actually doing by using uh, a lot of close-up of the surveillance cameras that they shot in the opening credits too, where they they're showing like several shots here and there. Even the uh, the shot at the end where where they show like all the pigeons, and you see, where they show a a face of Hannibal Lecter all together. I thought that was cool. And it moves after that. Yeah, I, I thought that was awesome. I also like Ray Liotta, you know, once again playing a, a creep in the movie, you know, as a <laughs> as a Justice Department, but because I knew exactly what he was going for, you know, even though he was an asshole in the movie, but <laughs> what do you expect? And then of course Gary Oldman playing Mason Virgil, you know, underneath that mask that he was wearing just to play that role. I mean, this was like Something I never expected to see underneath it, but yeah, because that's that's really something. You know, having seen him play a, a horribly disfigured man after what he, after what he actually did to his face, and he had to wear a wheelchair all this time and you know have his revenge. So that's interesting. Well, I do think they really need to do some editing on some of the scenes that they went into. You know, just to you know maybe cut down on the. Uh, the investigation to a, a tighter pace so then I think maybe the film would, would flow better uh, no matter what happens so that way they could focus between the two yeah then I think the film would have looked better that way and it probably needed some um, some improvement with the script a bit I mean this is coming from from a great writer and a playwright and of course uh, another good writer from that one film that he did I think they really need to flow it as it seems. But I know that's what they were going for because, you know, with all that controversy that they were going towards it to the film, that I think that's why they needed to fix it. Yeah, I mean, so that's what they so that's what they really needed to do for the movie to make it look better. But like I said, it's not a bad film. I think it's a, I think it's definitely worth watching. You know, for all the um, for all the scary moments that they went in, and and of course, you know, having to see Hannibal Lecter again for the first time in ten years, you know, for Anthony Hopkins to play. I mean, there's no other because there's no doubt about it. He's he's always going to be the best one for sit. No, no matter what. <laughs> I mean, it earned him an Oscar for that role. Um, that that's for sure. It's not one of Scott's weakest efforts that he had for. I mean, this was, of course, a big hit uh, back in 2001. You know, because it was trying to earn a success, you know, after that. You know, for a sequel, I, I think it's worth watching, at least. But don't expect it to be more like, you know, Manhunter or Signs of the Lambs, because it really isn't. And, once again, I, I love all the good shots that they had in the film. You know, some, some lot of dark ones that they went to. I love the music score that they chose um, by Hans Zimmer, you know, because he's a great composer coming from other films that he has done. I think that actually works. 
I mean, it's it's no uh, Howard Shore, but I think this is great. So it, it worked well. So it, it's cool. So anyway, but if if you want to check this movie out, um, then it's it's all right with me. It's it's like I said, it's it's worth watching if if it sets the mood straight, you know. And of course, if you love Hannibal Lecter and you love Anthony Hopkins, then this is the kind of mood that you really want to see. So, that's my uh, suggestion. So anyway, I give Hannibal three and a half stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.